Well, good evening. I see we have the remnant of the remnant. <laughs> the shaking has taken place. <laughs> Those who came for the food that perishes have left. <laughs> And those who came for the food that perisheth not are here. <laughs> now, I know Sunday is a difficult time. It's uh, probably the only day that uh, we have to take care of our own business. You know, Sabbath is the Lord's day. So Sunday is a very busy day, I'm sure. But we're going to go ahead. And uh, we are going to study a very interesting passage from Scripture. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. And we are going to begin our study at verse 13. Matthew 16 and verse 13. First of all, I would like to mention that this passage that we're going to study this evening is occurring about six months before the death of Christ. So Jesus has ministered for three years and he has six more months before his death. And as the text tells us, Jesus, according to verse 13, came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Now, if you look at a map of the Holy Land, you're going to find that Caesarea Philippi is just beyond the northern border of Israel, just beyond Galilee. It's actually in Gentile territory. In fact, Caesarea Philippi is at the foot of the great Mount Hermon, where the waters of the Jordan River originate. And it's a very beautiful area. Lots of luscious vegetation. And as Jesus was there, just outside the borders of Israel, he gathered his disciples around him to ask them a very important question. But before he asked that very important question, the Gospel of Luke, by the way, the transfiguration is um, described in all three of the synoptic gospels Matthew, Mark and Luke so when all three gospels describe it it's really important to look at what all three gospels have to say because they complement one another and so Jesus according to the passage in Luke Luke 9 verse 18 before he asked the questions he went by himself and he prayed. And the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that the reason he prayed was so that God would reveal to the disciples who he was. And of course the prayer of Jesus was answered. We're going to see that in a moment. So in verse 13, the last part of the verse, Jesus is going to ask a preliminary question, kind of to break the ice. And in that question, he says, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In other words, what are people out there saying about me? Who am I? And we find in verse 14, their answer. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. That's what people are saying out there. But now Jesus is going to ask them the question that he really was interested in having them answer. And that question is found in verse 15. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? I don't care what people are saying out there. Tell me what you think. Who do you think I am? And of course, Peter, who 
appear to be the spokesman of the disciples, many times putting his tongue in fourth gear before he put his brain in first gear, <laughs> had an answer for Jesus. Verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, when Peter said, you are the Christ, we need to keep in mind what the, what the word Christ means. In the Greek, it's the word Christos, which means anointed. It is exactly equivalent to the word Mashiach in Hebrew. In other words, Christos is Greek, and Mashiach is Hebrew. It's kind of like I say in English, house, and in Spanish I say casa. Casa is Spanish for house. They're the same concept but a different word. And so, we find Peter making this confession. You are the Messiah. You are the awaited Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then I want you to notice what Jesus says to Peter. It's in verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, you know, Peter didn't even know what he was saying. This didn't come because he had a momentary intuition, because he was really wise. This was given to him directly by God. That's what Jesus had been praying for. And so in verse 17, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Barjona means son of Jonah. For flesh and blood, what, what is the meaning of flesh and blood? It's a euphemism for a human being. In other words, humans, no human has revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, this confession was placed in the brain of Peter directly by God. It did not come from him. And we know that because Peter, later on in this story, is going to show that he didn't understand what he was saying. So in other words, God put the thought in his brain and it came out of his mouth. It didn't come from him. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to not look at verses 18 and 19, because that would be another sermon that we would have to deal with where Jesus says, you are Peter, you are Petros, you are Pebble. And upon this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church. And you know, uh, the King James Version says, and the, gate, and the gates of Hale, Hades shall not prevail against it. The word Hades simply means the grave. Jesus is saying, you are Peter, but upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the grave will not prevail against it. Now, why did Jesus say that? Because in a few moments, he's going to talk about his death and resurrection. He's going to resurrect from the dead. So that's, why the, re that's the reason why the gates of death and the grave will not pre prevail against him. So let's jump down to verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Remember that detail. That he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now, did that square with Peter's idea of the Messiah? No way. 
in the minds of Peter and the other disciples, the Messiah was going to come. He was going to destroy the hated Romans. And he was going to take over the throne and subject all kingdoms to himself. He was going to be a temporal ruler. So when Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be mistreated, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to be resurrected the third day, Peter and the disciples simply didn't understand what Jesus was saying. So going back to verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his, to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. Now we're going to see that Peter didn't understand his own confession. Verse 22. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Imagine that, Peter rebuking Jesus. The student rebuking the rabbi. And what did Peter say? Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. Did Peter really understand his confession? Did he understand what kind of Messiah Jesus was? Didn't have the foggiest idea. And now notice, verse 23 is very interesting. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that Jesus was not speaking primarily to Peter. He was speaking primarily to Satan. Do you know, repeatedly in the life of Jesus, Satan tried to distract Jesus from going to the cross. Beginning with the Mount of Temptation, Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Now Jesus knew he was going to have to die to recover those kingdoms that Adam lost. And so Satan now says, I'm going to give you an easier way. Piece of cake. All you have to do is bow and worship me just for an instant. And you don't have to suffer and die. It's all yours. What did Jesus say? Behind me, Satan. Then later on, when he fed the 5,000, in John chapter 6 and verse 15, it says that the multitude, and Ellen White affirms that it was Judas who was really influencing the multitude. They wanted to seize him and make him king. But Jesus left, disappeared, and went out by himself. And then there's the episode where Jesus is traveling back to Jerusalem, his last journey to Jerusalem. And he asked for permission to go through certain, uh, through certain towns of the Samaritans. And the town said to Jesus, we don't want you to come through our towns. It would have been a shortcut to Jerusalem. And so the two disciples, the sons of thunder, James and John, showed what kind of Messiah they'd expected. They said, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn up those cities? That's the kind of Messiah that they were expecting. And then we have Judas. Do you know Judas did not deliver Jesus because he wanted Jesus to be killed. What he wanted to do is he wanted to force the hand of Jesus so that Jesus would escape when he was mistreated. But his plan backfired and that's why he committed suicide. If he wanted Jesus to die, he wouldn't have committed suicide. And then even when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the fellows that were at the, at the foot of the cross says, if you are really the Messiah, come down. Satan did not want Jesus to give his life on the cross. And Satan was using Peter. Are you with me? Now I'm going to skip verses 24 to 26. We're going to come back to those at the end. Verses 24 to 26. I'm going to jump down to verse 27. It says, For the Son of Man 
will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he will reward each according to his works. What coming is that describing? The second coming of Christ, right? When he says the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels and then he will reward each according to his works, he's referring to a second coming. And then Jesus said something really strange in verse 28. Jesus says to his disciples after saying that he's going to come with his angels, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who were standing there. The disciples, right? The disciples were standing there. So Jesus says, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. How many of the disciples did not die? Huh? Did all the disciples die? Are they all dead? So Jesus lied. He says, some of you here, there are some of you here that will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. The, what he had just mentioned in the previous verse. The Son of Man will come with all the angels and then reward everyone according to His works. All the disciples died and some of them did not see the second coming of Jesus. How do we explain that? Ah, we have to go to the next chapter. Now here's a very important point. In the three synoptic gospels, when we say synoptic gospels, we're talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's only one place in all three gospels where there is a time period mentioned between one event and another. And that's in chapter 17, verse 1. We know how much time passed between Peter's confession and what Jesus said in verse 28 and what takes place in chapter 17. That indicates the fact that there's a mention, there's a mention of a time interval. It shows that the two events are what? Connected or linked. And so in chapter 17 it says, Now after six days... So how long had the disciples in Christ traveled after Jesus said that there are some here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom? Six days. Do you know what they did during those six days? They traveled from Caesarea Philippi down the western side of the Sea of Galilee and came to a very high mountain, most likely Mount Tabor, it's about 1,843 uh, feet above sea level. Do you use meters or feet here? Meters. Use meters. Well, uh, you've, you've kind of gotten away from, from the British. <laughs> but anyway, 1,800 square feet, you know, you divide that by three, and that gives you approximately the number of meters. So it's three plus feet to a meter. I like the metric system myself better too. It's much more consistent than inches and feet and gallons and all. Anyway, getting back here. What do you suppose happened during those six days that they were traveling south? Ellen White describes it. Jesus, as was the custom at that time, was walking ahead and close behind were the students, the disciples. Their faces were long. They were discouraged because now they saw that Jesus was moving towards Jerusalem. And Jesus has said, I'm going to Jerusalem and they're going to kill me they're going to mistreat me. They're going to kill me. And they, they kind of forgot that he said he was going to resurrect the third day. They didn't even notice that. 
So they're dejected, they're depressed, they're sad, they have long faces, Jesus is ahead of them, and so Jesus says, these individuals need some encouragement. Because they've confessed that I'm the Messiah, but they're confused because it doesn't appear like I'm the Messiah. They need some encouragement. And so it says in verse 1, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother. Some. Are you with me? Some. Jesus said, this, said there are some of you here who will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom with the angels. The some are Peter, James, and John. So Jesus takes them on a very high mountain, most likely Mount Tabor. And something spectacular happens. And he was transfigured before them. That uh, word transfigured is very interesting. In Greek, it's the word metamorpho'o. What word do we get in English from metamorpho'o? Metamorphosis. Do you know what a metamorphosis is? I know real well because when I was a kid, I had a hobby, collecting butterflies. I became quite professional, you know, in catching them, mounting them, classifying them, almost like an amateur entomologist. I was able to see the development of a butterfly from the moment that the, that, uh, that the mother butterfly laid the eggs on, on a leaf or wherever. The, the little egg would break, little itsy bitsy caterpillar would come out. Then the caterpillar would eat from the leaves of the tree. And the caterpillar would grow become a big caterpillar. And then the caterpillar would attach itself to a tree or to a leaf or, or to a door or wherever and would literally bury itself in what technically is, called, technically is called a chrysalis which we call a cocoon. A cocoon entered the, the, butter, uh, the, the caterpillar entered the cocoon. But then after a few days, something unbelievable happened. Lo and behold, the cocoon starts shaking violently. The outer part of the cocoon starts breaking up. And lo and behold, out comes a butterfly. Let me ask you, what similarity is there between a caterpillar and a butterfly? None. <laughs> None. It's a radical change. That's the word that's used here. Jesus went through a metamorphosis. In fact, the Gospel of Luke says that his appearance was altered. He did not look like the Jesus that the disciples knew. By the way, he appeared like he will appear at his second coming. Let's finish reading verse 2 and then we'll compare the other two Gospels. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. If you go to Revelation 1.16, the glorified Christ, after Jesus went to heaven, it says that his face was like the sun when John saw him. And his clothes became as white as the light. Now let's compare what the Gospel of Mark says. 
This would be Mark chapter 9. Is it chapter 9 or chapter 8? Chapter 9 and verse 2. Chapter 9 and verse 2. I like the way Mark describes. He uses, you know, he, he amplifies in common everyday language. He's, he's, a, he's the down-to-earth evangelist. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. <laughs> And then you have the description in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 9 and verse 29. And he prayed. The appearance of his face was altered. And his robe became white and glistening. In other words, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus looked like he will look at his second coming. For a moment, he looked like the glorified Christ. And the three disciples who were the sum that would not taste death until they saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, saw Jesus as he will appear when he comes in his kingdom. And now something interesting happens. Verse 3. And behold... We're back in Matthew chapter 16, sorry. Matthew 17, actually. Matthew 17, verse 3. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. <laughs> in other words, Moses and Elijah appeared to them. But they were talking with whom? They were talking with Jesus. Now let's take a look at uh, this Moses and Elijah theme. Moses and Elijah are the two greatest personages in the Old Testament. Moses is the founder of Israel and Elijah is the first prophet. So you, Jesus many times mentions Moses and the prophets, right? the law and the prophets. And by the way, that's the reason why in the book of Malachi, if you read chapter 4, the, the last couple of verses, verses 5 and 6, you'll find that God says, remember to keep the law that I gave Moses. And he says, behold, I send you Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Because they are two pillars in the Old Testament that went through severe, severe trials. It's hard to find any, anyone, anyone else in the Old Testament that went through the trials that Moses went through with 40 years in the wilderness with this rebellious people and Elijah in the, the Baal apostasy. But the question is, Where did Moses and Elijah come from? Hmm. Well, let's talk first of, all, first of all about Moses. There are two strange things about the death of Moses. Number one, nobody knew where he was buried. Very unusual among the Jews. Because the Jews marked the tombs of their heroes. For example, Abraham and his family were buried in the cave of Machpelah. The tomb of David can still be visited in the city of Jerusalem. And a few years ago, an inscription was found in a crypt that said, Here lies Daniel the prophet. There was no body, but there was an inscription that says, Here lies Daniel the prophet. So the Jews marked the tombs of their heroes, but when it came to Moses, nobody knew where, where his sepulcher was. The other strange thing, and this is in Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 and 6, is that God buried Moses. 
He's the only person in all of the Bible that God buried. And then lo and behold, if you read Jude 9, when Moses dies and he's buried, there's a battle at his tomb. Michael the archangel, who is a name for Christ, his name means who is like God. It's a title that is given to Christ. Christ, not, Christ isn't an angel, common angel. He's Michael, the archangel. Archangel means the chief of the angels or the head of the angels. And so we find Michael comes to the tomb and Satan is there to contest. They're fighting over the body of Moses. Do you think Jesus and the devil fight for every corpse of a person who's buried? That'd be kind of ridiculous to fight for a dead body. Oh, this is mine. No, it's mine. No. What had Michael come to do? He had come to resurrect Moses. And it's interesting to read what Ellen White has to say about that encounter there. You know, the devil argued. The devil said, you came to resurrect Moses. By the way, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel. The archangel is the one who resurrects the dead at the second coming. That's Jesus. And so Moses says, you, uh, 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 the devil says, Satan says, You can't take Moses. He sinned. He's mine. Jesus said, Yes, I won't deny that he sinned, but he repented. And he accepted my sacrifice. And Satan says, what sacrifice? You haven't been sacrificed. And Jesus says, that's true. But I'm going to be sacrificed. And Moses accepted my sacrifice by faith. How? Ah, but you haven't died yet. But anyway, Michael resurrected Christ. I mean, Christ, Michael, resurrected Moses. And took him to heaven. And we know that because he came to the Mount of Transfiguration. So he must have resurrected. Because the Bible says he died. And now he appears to Jesus on the Mount. Well, he must have resurrected if he's appearing. And then you have Elijah. Elijah's different. Because the Bible tells us that Elijah was taken to heaven without experiencing death. He was translated to heaven from among the living. He never experienced even physical death. So what do you have there on the Mount of Transfiguration? You have a miniature kingdom. The miniature kingdom of 1 Thessalonians 4. You have Moses who represents those who will die and resurrect. You have Elijah as those who will be translated from among the living. And you have the one in the middle who makes it all possible. So the disciples saw a miniature kingdom as Jesus will appear when he returns the second time and resurrects the dead, catches the, them up in the clouds and translates the living up into the clouds to go to the kingdom. Now you notice here it says that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus. Talking with Jesus. What were they talking about? Matthew doesn't tell us, but Luke does. See, that's why we need to look at all the Gospels. Go with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 31. Luke chapter 9 and verse 31. Let's read beginning with verse 30. It says, And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease which we, he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. 
Now that little word decease is very interesting. It's really not the best translation because you lose the connection with an event in the Old Testament. The word that is used in Greek is the word exodon. What word do we get in English from exodon? Exodus. What did they talk with Jesus about? His exodus that he was going to perform where? In Jerusalem. What had Jesus said he was going to do in Jerusalem? What had Jesus told the disciples? Why was he going to Jerusalem? He was going to be mistreated by the religious leaders and he was going to be what? Killed. He was going to be killed as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let me ask you, what is it that marked the beginning of the Exodus? The sacrifice of the Passover Lamb marked the beginning of the Exodus. And so the word exodon, and it's translated here, decease, which means to die, they spoke to him about his death as the Passover lamb, his exodus, the exodon. Now what did they say to Jesus? Jesus, you know the trials you're going to go through. It's going to be very difficult. The sins of the whole world are going to be placed upon you. And you're going to agonize in the garden. The very religious leaders are going to reject you. But hang in there. They were sent to encourage Christ to do what he said he was going to do. To go to Jerusalem and to die. Are you with me? And so, they're there, they're sent from heaven. Two individuals that have battles in this world are sent now to encourage Jesus to go forward. And I like to think that perhaps they might have said to Jesus, you know, if you don't go, we're going to have to get a return ticket. <laughs> and all of the redeemed will be lost. And that's why... It says in, in, in the Bible that the joy that was set, because of the joy that was set before him, he went to the cross. And the joy that was set before him was all of the redeemed that will be in the kingdom because of Jesus going and suffering and dying. And then, going back to Matthew chapter 16. There's a lot to unpack here, isn't there? Quite an interesting story. Then we go to chapter 17 and verse 5. While he was still speaking, uh, no, actually, uh, let's go to verse 4. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. <laughs> Why is Peter saying it's good for us to be here? Not Jerusalem. No, no, that's not going to, it's good for us to be here. So he says, let's build three tabernacles and stay here. He still didn't get it. And then verse 5, while he was still speaking, that is Peter, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. What was the reason for the transfiguration? It was to encourage the disciples and Jesus. The disciples, by the way, do you know what's interesting? There were three disciples that actually heard the agony of Jesus in Gethsemane. The other disciples were further away. But we are told in Matthew that Peter, James, and John, they were there close and they could hear the agonizing of Jesus in the garden. 
Who needed special encouragement when they were going to see Jesus going through those trials? Peter, James, and John. And so this was meant to encourage the disciples. Yes, Jesus is going to be killed. He's going to die. But hang in there. You saw that he was transfigured. After the sufferings, there's the glory. Hang in there. Not only was he transfigured, but the Bible tells us also that Moses and Elijah came. And of course the disciples, they're thinking, God would not send Moses and Elijah unless this guy was a messenger of God. And then to top it all off, the voice of the Father says, This is my beloved Son, hear Him. So all of these things are meant to strengthen the faith of the disciples and to strengthen Jesus to go to Jerusalem and to suffer and to die. Now, let's go back to the verses that we passed over, verses 24 to 26. I want to share with you four lessons that we can learn from the transfiguration as we near the end of our study together. Number one, we have on the Mount of Transfiguration a miniature kingdom, like I was mentioning before. In 1 Thessalonians 4, describes that many kingdom. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel in the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the Mount of Transfiguration assures us that Jesus is coming again, and there will be a kingdom. The second lesson is found in verses 24 to 26. You see, if we want to be in the kingdom, we have to go through the same experience that Jesus went through. There is no glorious kingdom without suffering first. Notice verses 24 to 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I'm going to the cross and after that comes the glory. Jesus is saying, you have to carry your cross and, the, and, and if you do, then comes the glory. Verse 25, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Did Jesus, save his, want to, did Jesus try to save his life? No. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? There is no glorious kingdom without suffering with Jesus. No crown without a cross. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Here it comes through very clearly. And I'm dealing with the new Bible here, so bear with me. 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 and 13 says this. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. There is no crown without a cross. So we should thank the Lord for trials and tribulations. The Apostle Paul said, we rejoice in tribulations. Oh, what was he, a masochist? No. We need to experience what Jesus experienced in order to receive the kingdom. The third lesson and the final lesson that I want to share with you was written by the Apostle Peter many years later. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 
And beginning with verse 16, this is written decades after the transfiguration. Jesus had died, Jesus had resurrected, Peter and the disciples had seen Jesus go to heaven. Uh, I mean, they knew now, that they had a clear understanding about uh, the fact that Jesus would suffer first and then he would enter glory. And so now he reminisces about what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there's a very important truth here. Verse 16. Here Peter says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. No, we're not telling you some tale. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's talking about the transfiguration, isn't it? And we heard this voice. Notice they saw him transfigured and they heard the voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And I don't like the way the New, the New King James expresses this. Verse 19. We, the King James says, we also have, what? The more sure word of prophecy. We have the more sure word of prophecy. More sure than what? More sure than seeing it or hearing it. What's more trustworthy? That Peter and the disciples saw and heard? Or is it the fact that the Bible says that he's coming again? The Bible says he's coming again. And that's more sure than if we saw it with our eyes and he heard it with our ears. So Peter is saying you can take it to the bank that Jesus is coming again. Not because we saw it and heard it, but because the prophecies of the Bible tell us so. And so the Mount of Transfiguration gives us great encouragement, doesn't it? Ha <laughs> ha! The mini kingdom means that there's going to be the great kingdom. If we suffer with him, we will reign with him. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy, and we can take it to the bank, not because we've seen it and heard it, but because God says so, that he's coming again. And I believe that he's coming very soon by what we're seeing in the world. And by the way, this is the reason why hell and uh, his ministry and secrets unsealed and our ministry emphasizes so much the importance of prophecy. You know, there are individuals that say, oh, all you guys talk about is prophecy. Well, the Adventist church originated as a prophetic movement. And the things in the world show us that prophecy is being fulfilled. And the three angels' message is our prophecy. The prophecies made us what we are. And woe to us if we do not preach the prophecies as they are found in the Word of God. Now I'm going to have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to give you the opportunity just for a few minutes to ask questions. Any question you want about this or anything. I'll put myself on the line. If I can't answer it, I'll say so. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this story of the transfiguration. It gives us courage. It gives us hope. It strengthens our faith. Oh, how we long for the coming of Jesus. We're tired of living in this dark, sinful world. Lord, help us to keep our, our eyes on the better land. As Ellen White says in her writing, she says, When I went to heaven, I never wanted to come back. I begged the angel to let me stay there. Oh, Father, I ask that that will be our feeling. 
We thank you, Lord, for having been with us and for having spoken to us through your word this evening. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.